Hello friends, this video on sexual reproduction in flowering plants part 22 is brought to you by examfear.com. No more fear from exam. Question number 6. What is self incompatibility? Why does self pollination not lead to seed formation in self incompatible species? So whenever the word incompatible comes into picture that means there is some incompatibility or there is some mismatch between the pollen and the pistil. So genetic incompatibility between individuals of same or different species is known as self incompatibility. So what does it do? It prevents self pollinations. Now let us suppose that the ant, that the pollen grains, let us consider this flower. Okay. So in this flower, if the pollen grains which are produced by this stamen, if this pollen grain and this stigma, if they are not compatible with each other, that is the pollen pistil compatibility is there, then what will happen? Self-pollination will not be able to take place because the pistil will not accept the pollen. And if the pistil doesn't accept the pollen, the pollen tube will not be formed and pollination will not take place. So this will prevent self-pollination. So stigma will reject the pollen germination, so pollen tube formation will not take place. And as a result, fertilization does not occur. So all these steps will follow because of pollen pistil incompatibility. So therefore, there will be no seed formation because fertilization has not occurred, so there is no seed formation as well. Now, there is that other technique of aponixis, but that has nothing to do with this. Aponixis is totally different. It is almost like an asexual mode where the nucellus cells will divide to form seeds. Question number seven. Why do you think the zygote is dormant for some time in a fertilized ovule? Now, as soon as the ovule gets fertilized, what happens? It becomes a seed. And what happens inside? Inside a zygote is formed and a PEC, that is primary endosperm cell, is formed. So two things are formed inside. Now the zygote waits for the formation of endosperm. Now what are the two things that are formed inside? One is primary endosperm cell and the other is zygote. Now over a period of time after fertilization, this primary endosperm cell will develop into endosperm and this zygote will develop into embryo. Now for the zygote to develop into embryo, it needs some nutrition and the nutrition is provided by the endosperm. So the zygote waits for some time so that the endosperm is first formed. Once the endosperm is formed, the endosperm will be able to provide it with the nutrition and by getting that nourishment, the zygote will start its development. So endosperm provides nourishment to the zygote to develop it into embryo. And the endosperm itself develops from the primary endosperm cell. Now after the endosperm is formed, development of zygote begins. So this is the primary endosperm cell and this is the zygote. Differentiate between hypocotyle and epicotyle, polyoptyle and coloriza, integument and testa, perisperm and pericard. So let us start with hypocotyle and epicotyle. Hypo always means less. So that part of the embryonal axis which is less than the cotyledons, that is which is below the cotyledons and epicotyle is above the cotyledon. So hypocotyle terminates at radical and epicotyle terminates at the clemule. Polyoptyle and coleoriza, these are present in monocot seed. They are not present in dicot seed. So that is one similarity that both of them are present in monocot seed. Coleoptyle encloses plimule, it is a covering of the plimule. Coleoriza is a covering of the radical. So structure-wise, coleoptyle is a conical sheath. It is shaped in the form of a cone. Coleoriza is an undifferentiated sheath. So it is not exactly differentiated, just a mass of cells which encloses the radical. Integument and testa. So integument are the layers which covers the ovule. This can be one single layer or it can be multiple layers. Whereas testa is the outermost covering of the seed. So testa is a thick and dead layer, whereas integument is a thin layer but it is living. So integument exists 
during the pre-fertilization events, that is before fertilization takes place, that time only ovule exists when, and when ovule exists, integument exists. After fertilization, the ovule gets converted into a seed. Therefore, there is no more integument. The integument gets converted into the seed coat and that seed coat is nothing but it has testa as the outer layer. Perisperm and pericarp. So the names look similar but they are totally different stuffs. Pericarp is the wall of the fruit. So when the ovary gets converted into the fruit, the outermost layer of the fruit is called the pericarp. And perisperm is the remains of the new cellars which is still present in some seeds. Like in the seeds you saw that some of the remains of the ovule still exists. Right? The ovule only turns into a seed. Now inside the ovule, new cellus was also there before. Now sometimes there are no remains, but sometimes there are some remains of the new cellus which are still present and that forms the perisperm. So it is formed by remains of the ovule. Pericarp is formed by that wall of ovary. So pericarp is part of the ovary. Perisperm is generally dry, but pericarp can be dry or it can be fleshy. Question number nine. Why is apple called a false fruit? Which part of the flower forms the fruit? So here, as I mentioned, which part of the flower forms the fruit? It is the swollen thalamus that actually forms the fruit or which actually forms the edible part. And why is it called a false fruit? Because the edible part is the fleshy receptacle and it is not directly derived from the ovary. And where is the true ovary? The true ovary is deep inside. Somewhere here, the true ovary is located there. On the other hand, a true fruit is one which is directly derived from ovary. So since it doesn't match with the definition of true fruit, that is why it is a false fruit. Question number 10. What is meant by emasculation? When and why does a plant breeder employ this technique? So what is emasculation? As we discussed, masculation is something related to the male part. So emasculation means removal of the male part. So removal of anther from bisexual flowers of the female parent plant. So if you have the female parent plant where which has bisexual flowers, that is they have got both the male and the female parts. So the anthers are removed from there and this is done before the anthers mature. Now the question is why do we do this and when do we do this? So when you do it, the answer of when is that it is done before the anthers mature. And the question is why do we do this? Why are we removing this part? In order to prevent self-pollination because we don't want self-pollination to take place. Now once the male uh, or the anthers are removed, so only the female part is left over. So self-pollination cannot take place. So there has to be cross-pollination. So breeder use this technique to obtain desired variety of plant because now the pollen grains can be given by the breeder. So breeder can give his own desired variety of pollen grains and then fertilization can happen. So during this technique, emasculation is also followed by another technique called bagging where the emasculated flower is covered by a bag so that it, it does not come in contact with any other unwanted pollen grains. And then the desired pollen grains are dusted on the stigma and finally the flower is again put inside the bag so that again no further contamination happens. So these steps are followed in order to obtain desired variety of a plant. Question number 11. If one can induce parthenocarpy through the application of growth substances, which fruits would you select? to induce parthenocarpy and why. Now parthenocarpy is going to produce fruits which are without seeds. So we will get seedless varieties of all the fruits. So we will obviously try it on fruits which have got seeds and we do not want the seeds. For example grapes. We would like to have seedless varieties of grapes or seedless variety of banana. So seedless fruits would be produced by parthenocarpy. So seedless varieties of economically important fruits can be obtained as this technique enables fruit formation without fertilization. Because fertilization doesn't happen, therefore the seeds are not formed. And even before the seeds are formed, the ovary is ripened to form the fruit. 
क्वेश्चन नंबर ट्वेल्व एक्सप्लेन द रोल ऑफ टेपेटम इन द फॉर्मेशन ऑफ पॉलिन ग्रेन वॉल सो वॉट इज टेपेटम इट इज द इनर मोस्ट वॉल इनर मोस्ट लेयर ऑफ द माइक्रोस्पोरजियम just remember the structure of microsporangium when this structure is magnified you get something like this so these are the layers this is the outermost epidermis then you have the endothecium then you have the middle layers and finally you have the innermost layer which is the tapetum so the outer three layers they ensure protection of the microsporangium but the innermost layer it provides nourishment to the pollen grains which would be growing inside the microsporangium right so this will provide nourishment to the pollen grains so that is its most important purpose it also helps in the formation of exine of pollen grains because it is just the uh, next layer after the pollen grain so let us suppose if the pollen grains are formed here and here you have the tapetum so this tapetum will also help in the formation of the outermost layer of pollen grain the outermost layer is exine so these are the two important roles of the uh, tapetum so with this we have reached towards the end of this lesson and i hope that this lesson on sexual reproduction in plants would have helped you if not please try to grow please try to understand the concepts in detail if you want you can go back and recap some of the videos which you are still not much comfortable with so see you all in the next lesson visit www.examfear.com to watch more videos attempt free online test get free study material find tutors and mentors thank you once again